Yeah, all right. Let's go ahead and get started. Okay, hopefully everybody can hear me today. Today we're going to run through the class on medieval sphere, as you know. This there is a paper that I wrote on the uh, Punta Longa. It's nearing final completion now. It's mostly done. Um, we're going to talk about common spear, so not spear a la Fiore de Liberi, but rather spear the way it was fought from the second half of the 14th century onward. Um, and I say the second half of the 14th century onward because uh, I didn't realize this before, but it appears there was a change in the mid 14th century. People went from wielding the spear in one hand, say with a shield this way or this way, to wielding it in two hands, both hands on the spear. Um, still middle of research, but seems to suggest the reason for that was the development of plate armor and you needed two hands to actually get through and be more precise with your point. Let's see. So um, we're going to talk about how the common method works. Fiori does actually show this in the manuscript, um, but he doesn't advise it. Nonetheless, um, the a sort of spectrum of combat he's offering is a very small one for some of this. And we're going to match up what most people seem to have been doing with the spear during the 14th century. I have additional stuff if you want to look at the way Fiore wants to work with the spear. It's a little bit different, and it's usually after you close. So we're going to go down the list here. We're going to talk about what a common spear is a little bit. We're going to look at sort of the stance, grips, um, and the simulators themselves. We'll look at the targeting very briefly. These are quick things uh, before looking to for the basic uh, fundamental of driving forward and striking somebody. Most of you who are in the class now have fought a little bit of spear, so you seen this or done it intuitively. Uh, maybe you get some little things out of it. And it's meant more or less as a foundation class for folks who may not have fought it much before. As some of you know, I like to teach the spear as the first sort of sparring weapon that people can get to um, because it's very simple. It's much like chess or checkers rather, as opposed to long sword, which I find to be much more like chess. So there's an easy way to get in. So on that front, we're looking at a spear that looks Something like this, medievally. Uh, hopefully you're seeing it on the screen there. That is a pretty much a textbook 14th and 15th century spear. It um, has a very thick socket. You can see it's almost 3 sixteenths of an inch thick and um, an, an acute point. The spear didn't change that much. And there, there is some terminology issue here because historically you'll find that the spear was often called the lance, um, either in inventories or chronicles. And translators are usually not very careful about how they translate it. So most of the stuff that we get in translation, it's very hard to pick apart what they meant. Functionally, there wasn't a lot of difference. I'm finding in the 15th century differences in reference between a heavy and a light spear that might represent the shaft thickness. Um, prior to the 14th century, the shafts were seemingly very thin, five eighths of an inch maybe, uh, three quarters of an inch, um, much thinner than we might guess. But remember, the spear is being wielded in one hand at that point. Uh, by the time you get to the later part of the 14th century, it's wielded in two hands, and the socket seems more standardized, something around seven inches of inch. Uh, so for in terms of your simulators, uh, I find that bow staves work quite well for this. Um, the revival spear tips, of course, I like those pretty much the best. Cold steel ones will work, or in a pinch, you can actually use, of course, like a pool noodle, which you're going to then go ahead and wrap around a shaft. Uh, for shafts these days, we have a lot of different options. Um, for five bucks, you can get on the Lowe's and get a poplar dowel, six feet long, um, or you can go to like 493 a piece. And as long as you shave down the end so it's got a little taper to it, and then pop your rubber spear head on there or make your foam one, put that on there, um, should last a good long time. Uh, for more serious folks, you can get both shafts to generally work. Um, for folks in the SCA, if you have to, if you're doing heavy, then you gotta get a rattan shaft. If you do use like a one and a quarter inch shaft on these spears, are really not made for that. Um, even though you can do it, you really want to shave down the half quite a bit in terms of making a cone for the thing to fit inside. Uh, fighting with a spear shaft that gives a little bit of flex to it is nice because that means you don't have to have a lot of armor on the other side. So a mask and or a jacket would work really well. Um, the other ones, the cold steel ones, don't give as much. They're pretty floppy side to side, but they do function and they're fairly cheap. 15 bucks, I think. Um, you can have a spear tips out there. Or, like I said, a pool noodle and some duct tape. And for three bucks, you can have let's say, a head of your spear. And uh, for five more, you can have a spear haft. Though, 
Um, generally speaking, those don't look as good, of course. Um, so these things are about six feet long on the short spear. Uh, you'll find in images all throughout the Middle Ages, you'll find lots of pictures of people fighting with a short six foot spear. Uh, contrast this with a, a longer eight or nine foot spear um, that was becoming common in the end of the 14th century. Um, or the Saracena, of course, the Alexandrian spear that's supposed to have been 30 feet long. You know, that seems pretty much used to spear that seems quite long. We're going to be talking about the short spear, wielded at the hip pretty much, in the common method, two hands, and using these simulators. So it, let's make sure no one's trying to get in here. Okay, got everybody in. Um, so we're going to talk through the fundamentals and then I'll go ahead and switch over now. So most, for the most part, the fundamentals that drive the spear are the same as the ones that drive your other weapons. So you're still going to use a full body twist. You're still going to go ahead and use a, um, uh, try to get control of both hands. And you're both going to shoot for targets that are available, legal, and uh, readily at hand. So uh, in an armored context, you'd be looking for things where the armor isn't, because the spear isn't going to penetrate plate, at least not easily, and certainly not on foot. Uh, male, maybe, with two hands. So in um, the simulation, if you have two hands and pop them on the male pretty good, that might do it. In limited degree, one hand, it doesn't hit quite as hard with one hand, but that's where you're looking for the weaker spots. So uh, you can use that, take that into account with your simulation too. I'm going to stop sharing the screen now and hope that it'll cover over the camera so you can start in with the practical stuff. Do I have any questions on just that floor material? All right, there's a lot more of that in the document. I don't think we need to cover a lot of it in the video. Um, and I'll make the document available after this is over. I'm going to stop the share now. With any luck, you should see me on the screen. Okay, can you see the studio now? Yeah, we see. Okay. Yes. Yep. All right, so fundamentals of this thing, you're going to fight it pretty much with a stance the same way that you'd fight any other weapon. So the weight on the inside ball of the foot, you don't want to be on the outside because that can't can't the knee over. Um, you want to have the uh, shoulders a little bit, or the feet a little bit wider than shoulder length apart. Um, and you want to have the back hand aligning with the hip. And there is a possibility you can always step forward and start off with the same foot. And then we'll talk about that a little bit. It's a tactical choice you might make. Um, useful, uh, but for the main part, we're going to stick with the left foot forward on the right hand. The stick, the pole, like, or the spear, like most pole arms, you can have on the right and the left. So the stance is exactly the same on the other side. Unlike the long sword, you of course switch your hands. If you were switching sides of the long sword, you wouldn't change which hand is up near the hilt, but on a spear you do, you go ahead and change sides. And that's actually a good exercise to work on if you get new gauntlets especially. Make sure you can do this in your gauntlets, because that's how you're mostly going to be looking at it when you fight. Um, the main position for the spear is going to be anchored at the hip. So for folks in the skull, that's not a big surprise, because the hip is where everything comes from anyway. So you're driving the motion. The hand is resting kind of back with the hip. The front hand is just supporting the thing. On the left side, it's the same exact way. The only caveat is I don't actually sit my hand up on the hip. I kind of have it down with just short of extension, ready to go, and I can have either foot forward still in line with the hip moving forward. So the whole kinesthetic is going to be keeping this moving from the hip directly to the target. We're not going to talk about the high line much here. We're talking about the common method that's uh, illustrated most often. So we'll talk about the high line in another video. Um, but here, you want to keep that back, just kind of almost like your hand is back holding under a holster or a pistol on your hip, ready to go. Um, so none of that should be really a surprise. There are some things with the grip, though. If you look at a lot of manuscript pictures, they'll ha often have the hand clear up here, nine inches. Maybe you can see it better here, nine inches or so away from the end of the spear. Um, I actually slide my hand all the way down so that it's right at the end with the pinky just overlying the end, so I know where the end is. The reason I do that is because the spear is a distance weapon. So I'm trying to maximize every inch I get out of that thing by moving it all the way to the end. This way, as I finish a strike, I'm going to be striking all the way to the end and keeping it just at the end of the spear. If I choke up, I lose all that distance. So novices will oftentimes just pick up the spear this way, which is fine if you want to close and play with it like a staff, but if you're maximizing for distance, you want to have the little finger over the end, or at least have your hand near the end of the, of the spear. Um, I like that little metric of having it there, because that tells me exactly where the end of the weapon is. If it's here, I'm not really sure. Probably an inch down there, but I have no way to tell. Uh, this way, I know where she is. Um, so the forehand, there are two variations on this. One, 
for distance, the thumb is forward. Hopefully you can see it here. Thumb is forward on, the, on this area. This is maximizing for distance. So when I move forward, the forward king hand stays uh, with the thumb forward. On the other hand, if I'm bringing back and I want to close and get power, I'll actually flip the hand so now the little finger is forward. This gives you far more stability. If you try this, you'll see it's much more stable. Uh, it's also much more limiting in terms of how far you can actually go forward, whereas if you release the other hand, you can pull the other one much, much further. So um, typically what I'll do is I'll tell people when you're finding a distance, use the thumb distance, but as you close to play close, then move to the small, uh, small finger forward as an option. You can still have the thumb forward, you get a little more flexibility with that, um, but you don't get as much strength. So you go either way. Now, one of the good drills I like to show people is to flip between those. So you strike and then bring it back comfortably in the other hand and then get ready to throw a second and third strike. Again, try this in gauntlets because in gauntlets you're gonna see that it, uh, very often if you're not familiar with the gauntlets, they'll foul up and you'll have a hard time letting go and gripping it. That's true of any pole arms or pole axe. I wanna be sure I can get the pole weapon in any sort of configuration with the gauntlets I'm gonna be using. So. Um, it's good just to play with the staff or the spear a little bit and just get familiar with how it feels when you're pulling it back at hand. Now, the next thing is you can change size. What you have on one side, you have equally on the other. So being able to change the side, you might strike forward and then pull it back at rest on the other side, on the other side with that. So this is useful, of course, because shield men tend to be fighting with the sword most of the times on their right side. So I actually prefer a left-sided stance when I'm fighting at the ends of a shield wall, I walk all the way to the left side of the wall and I stand here and pop inside. You can do it this way against the right-handed shield, but you're fighting against the shield. So it works a lot better in my experience if you've got it both sides. The other thing about the pole arm is that it matters a great deal whether you're gonna cover in front of the pole arm, sort of where your hands are pushing off or the, the blow is coming in behind. It's much more difficult to catch behind. So if I think there's a big chance of a blow coming in on this side, I'll probably set up on that side so I have a better chance of catching the thing that comes in on my strong side. As you can see, if I switch sides, something's still coming in from this side, it's difficult to get the spear over to cover, um, or any form for that matter. So it matters whether you're fighting on the right or the left, and this is where, in skull land, we talk about a mezzavolta, so I might change sides. In strike, now I'm fighting on the right side, now I'm fighting on the left. So it uh, should be no big mysteries. Um, everything is more or less helped in the center of the body. Um, we'll talk about the kinesthetics of the blow next. Any questions on the stance? It's pretty basic. All right, so the basic strike is also pretty basic. You're gonna start in a position that Pierre de Berry would call something like breva serpentina, the short snake's guard. So you're down at the hip, and you're gonna step forward for the basic strike and fire all the way to where you have both hands, just the second hand leaving the spear, and you can actually go a little bit further than that to extend the max distance. Um, that is the farthest reach you can really hit with the spear. If your opponent, for example, is choked up and they don't want to extend so far, you can safely pop at them from max range, um, and you can probably get a strike or two in before they can do anything. But you can execute these in quick succession, one after the next, shooting at different targets, um, and it's pretty easy to do. So um, the kinesthetic will move from the hip, driving outwards towards post, from post of Reva, out towards something that would resemble post of longer. This is not in Fury stuff because he never pulls the second hand off the spear. But um, I found that, and, and many other people have found, it's very useful to be able to extend the spear to its max distance. Uh, once you're at that max distance though, you have a tactical decision to make. So you're gonna fire outwards, and then you have to decide what to do. You can either rip it back with the, and continue to play the range game, which I might do and pull back with my thumb forward. I might rip it back if I'm being closed in on, like a shieldman's closing in on me, I might pull it back to get extra strength with the pinky forward. Or I might fire out there and then I might decide to advance under the spear. So once I step forward instead of stepping back, I'm stepping up to the spear rather than pulling the spear back to me. So that's the number one tactical choice you have when making a, a, an attack. When you're doing this in a one-on-one -on -one spear fight, the, it's very nice to be able to fire over, make your attack, then close as you wish. From this point, all of Peoria's spada and arm, the armor plays, or the, uh, his spear plays will work from that distance. But the punta longa, as I like to call it, will get you there 
get you a free strike on the way in and give them something to think about while you're closing. It's also the main strike you're going to use when you're fighting in groups and whatnot, fighting just from the hip, firing outwards, and then pulling it back. In groups, especially the distance is very, very important. So you probably don't want to come forward unless you're really driving towards something important because you're going to come to the range of many other spearmen who will be delighted to strike you on that. Breastplate, helmet, groin, wherever, whatever looks good. So um, generally speaking, you want to uh, save that advancing mode for when you're with one person um, or a limited number. So the basic strike from Breva out to Longa and back, or Breva collect up back into Breva with a step forward. Not complicated. Um, that tactical choice, though, is what you want to work on, having the ability to fire outwards and then rip it back. Um, I found that teaching people to do multiple strikes is very useful. Firing once and not stopping there, but just bringing it back and firing again. Not at a random spot, but at a target. So you might set up on a pel and try to hit like body, head, body, or um, head, 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 or head, leg, head. Um, being able to throw little groups, not just of threes, but um, incredible numbers of shots. I saw an SCA fellow set up at a bridge, and the bridge wasn't going anywhere because there was a fellow on the other side who was almost seven foot three or seven foot four tall. And he was standing back in the third rank, and he was just popping people randomly. So this fellow was killing virtually everybody that we had, and there wasn't really, okay, nobody's coming in. And so he asked me, we need it done, and I said, um, we need that guy in the third rank back there killed. So he went up, took the spear, fired it, pulled it back, just barely touched it with the other hand, using his hand as an end cap, then fired it back. He did this nine times in succession with a nine foot SCA spear. Each time the spear fired forward, it killed somebody, knocked him down. And the last person he killed was that fellow in the back that was seven two. Worked his way back to him, knocked him dead, and then came back. So the idea that you're striking aggressively for a target every time, pulling it back, not randomly striking, but striking for another target, uh, getting that into your head will make the difference between being a basic combatant and being an intermediate or advanced combatant. Uh, at least at distance. And it's you'll find the weapon's really, really super aerobic, so it takes a lot of wind to do that. Uh, but it's a good workout. It's much more like a sprint workout or a speed bag type workout than it might be with a, a long run or something of that sort. Um, so some, the thing is pretty basic in its essence, right? You're going to fire, hit your tar towards a target, and come back. Now, targets, full body target. So if we're in a scola context, the hands, the forward foot, um, being nice to the groin, but you can still hit it. Um, all these things are good targets. If you're in armor, ideally you want to place it on a non-armored spot. So the neck is a good spot, the armpit, under the fall, something like that. Um, these are all good targeting points to fire at. Even if he's got a plain gauntlet on, oftentimes you'll see the thumb of the hand. And with one of these rubber tips, you're not really going to hurt him by putting it in there, but he'll know that you put your slam it in there. Um, so um, those are all viable targets. Um, if you're not using armor counts rules, then just to strike on any close surface. This whole forward arm is a, is a fantastic target because it sits right out there in the front. You can be pretty far away when you hit it. And if your target is accurate, then you can pop it pretty securely, even with a tiny little tip like this. It's possible to do. Um, so no great secrets on the weapon as a whole. Um, being aggressive, though, isn't going to do it. You're going to want to, well, let's talk about any questions about the offense first, just simple strikes. Observations, maybe? Anybody do anything different that seems to work as well? All right. So um, now we have somebody new trying to come in. Let's see if I can actually let him in. All right. Maybe that works. OK. So defending with the spear, your two most important components are distance and time. So being just barely at a distance when you're playing with the spear at distance is the most important thing. You'll find that one or two inches makes all the difference in the world. So learning to use your accessories with skill and just not up a tiny bit might be enough. Uh, having a full step is usually a little bit too much unless you're closing in on the fight. So just tiny little adjustments with the spear can make all the difference. Uh, you can lean back just a tiny bit, miss it, and then fire back in that moment when, they've, when they're already expended. Uh, timing also, because once they fire, if as long as you're not being struck, firing 
after that is a fine time to shoot because they're not going to be hitting you. Um, but you may have to deflect. And if you do that, in order to deflect, you're going to move the spear in the way. It's going to be a little tough to show. And we'll see if I can actually get these folks in. Okay, so possibly. Um, so you're going to have to deflect with the spear. Now, in turning uh, some terminology, there's all kinds of different modes. I like to simplify this down to everything above this hand is the head, between the hands is the body, and below the hands is the tail. Um, it gets us out of some of the weird uh, historical terminology that doesn't seem to map one master to the next. So um, most of your covers are going to be done with the head of the thing. You're going to move just like Fury exchanges the thrust, pop, pop the spear in advance. I can't really show you this as a second person here. Show it to you what fencers might call an opposition and then drive along um, their inside of their spear. So we'll have to wait to show you that in some detail later when we've actually got the second person here. Um, but for now, um, you're just going to cover strikes before they hit you and just drive the point offline. You don't need to come way across. Just a tiny bit is all you need, just enough so that their point will miss you. And then you can return fire effectively. Um, so not very complicated, pretty simple, um, even on the defense. Now, what if they fire on the backside? Well, that's where having a spear on this side is a little bit of a problem. You usually have to jerk across and move the spear out of the way and then try to come back. It's possible, but if you're feeling like they're hitting after this side a lot, then you simply execute a change of side so you've got the strong part of the spear back where it belongs. And so it's a lot easier um, to deal with that one. Um, mostly, though, you're going to use distance and timing until you close. And since we're talking mostly about the common spear here and not any of Fiori's techniques, um, we're just going to talk about that sort of distance. So mostly uh, good drills to do to set up to that are get a couple people in masks and gloves and fire at each other, deflect the spear on the way in and fire back. Do a bunch of sets of those. Uh, there's really not much uh, replacement for that. These rubber tips have been accepted in a SCA rapier sense uh, to be used in that sense, but they do, as I understand it, an inch and a quarter half rule, which is unfortunate. Um, but these things work with just masks, so um, the same will work with a helmet, but you'll find you need to punch a little bit harder with it, and these tips are really um, designed for showing that you're being hit off the armor rather than on it, uh, which is, I think, historically accurate because you wouldn't be taking a blow with Bassin anyway unless it was really driven in hard. Um, so, not a lot on defense. There is one thing I wanted to cover at the end, though, kind of a special thing, where when you close in or when your opponent starts to close in, don't forget that both hands can slide along the haft. So if my opponent's closing in dramatically and I've been caught short, I can always shorten up the spear and then make it a short, nasty little spear and pop them on the way in. Uh, very often you'll see videos of folks who get in close and one person will slide the other spear back, they've got the other guy's spear in their hand maybe and they pop it through. Uh, perfectly legitimate, nothing wrong with that, uh, but people forget that you can slide in that forward hand. Just the same way you're sliding in reverse, you can also slide all the way back, you can even take it all the way with the back hand all the way to the tip. Um, if you're fighting in a, a HEMA context or something of that sort of course, this whole thing can be a short staff. And I typically don't let my new students fight with it as a staff until uh, we've gotten some of the spot in our material mastered uh, because our, uh, becomes, it just becomes a nasty little pole axe. And typically I want them to have some armor when they get to that point um, because it, obviously it's going to throw a lot more power in that and just this nice little rubber tip bounce off your face. Um, so not a complicated weapon. Pretty simple. Um, I tend to have people do drills shooting at, at targets like a, a tether ball or a pell, um, or even my hand with the rubber ones. Um, it just doesn't really hurt. Um, and then just getting the basic kinesthetics down. So in terms of kinesthetics, just stepping and firing and then driving back. Stepping and firing and driving back on the other side. Stepping and firing. And then stepping and changing hands and closing, stepping under the spear, and then continuing to strike. So nothing complicated, simple, simple weapon. Uh, the hope with this sort of thing is that we can be able to give short modules from the workshop um, and hopefully be able to see it. This unfortunately we had to kludge today because the laptop for some reason didn't recognize the second monitor. So um, usually we won't have slides to show you and that won't really be an issue. So, um, but hopefully, you know, it gives you a, a little bit of a starting point of where to go. Um, I really think this is a super valuable entry level weapon but it never really loses its allure because you can use it um, at the end of practice when you're exhausted. You can uh, have a very complex, sophisticated fight out of it, or you can hand it to any beginner 
who's had you know a couple of sessions of footwork and they're ready to go. So um, they could even you know fight tournaments pretty early with this. At least that's the way I tend to run it in Escola. So um, what questions do we have out there? It's kind of a this class is intended a much faster, not a two-hour armor class, but rather sort of a short set of techniques that we might go into. Uh, what do what questions do we have out there? What observations do we have? Hey Brian. Yeah. I'd like to transition from the uh, the the rear hand being all the way at the back of the haft into yeah. Fiori's where it's you know within a forearms from the back of the haft. That's usually because if I'm going to transition to that, all I'm going to do is end up sliding it in. Fiori is using it much more like a staff, and he's using it up close. So a lot of the areas you'll see Fiori fighting with it this way. I didn't cover any of that this time because um, I think Fiori's method is not the common method. He shows the common method in there, but he doesn't. He shows. He says that his techniques will beat that. That's true in a one-on-one -on -one situation, but I wouldn't go fighting this way in a multi-person environment or this way even if I've got a maximized distance. So given that spear, a lot of spear fights take part at the very maximum part of distance, that's why I would pull all the way back to the end of the spear. I suspect, honestly, that he didn't do a lot of sort of battlefield level spear fighting um, and because most combatants who fight with it tend to fight with it exactly the same uh, based on that. They don't necessarily put the small finger back, but they're all trying to maximize that, that distance. Um, You'll see a mix in the um, iconographic works. Often there's three or four inches back here at the end. Um, I mean, in some degree that's insurance, right? I can bring this around if I need to as a little blocking device or if I've got a foot or more I can bring it around. Um, but typically if I'm fighting a distance, say I'm fighting over a barrier or I'm fighting in a group combat, um, I don't need necessarily to close. So I actually maximize every instance of that. And frankly, I would maximize my distance on the first strike and then as I enter in, go ahead and snug it up if I need to. A transition is just pulling your hand forward, so it doesn't take much. Um, and you should feel your hand shouldn't be rooted to any one place on the spear shaft. It should move fluidly along the half based on what you're trying to do at that time. If, let's say, I was trying to move, transition to a Fiorian sort of position here, then all I have to do really is pull it up and drive over, and I'm there. So just being light on the, on the spear shaft itself can do that. Did that answer your question, Ed? Yes. What else do we have? Here. All right, what's the question? All right, let's see. Boy, I really cannot see in the sun here. Let's see. Hey, Brian, I got a question. Uh, okay. You mentioned with the defense about um, you know, deflecting the opponent's spear and not over committing and swinging too wide. And it's definitely something I do a lot. Do you have any uh, tips, tricks on, on how to, I don't know, practice that better, train other than just just do it better? <clears throat> well, try this. Try getting one of the, some of those scaleros there to fire at you with the spear, stand in defense, just pop it off a tiny bit and immediately repost as fast as you can get in there to make a reverse. And if you've got that speed of that, remember Fiora would call that subito, I want to res respond subito or retrieve that initiative. The way I would do it just under drills. So just keep popping it and then that'll teach you you'll feel how long it takes once you pop it all the way off the line. Now, of course, Fiora would be breaking the thrust there, and if that were the case, that seems like a time to go in and wrestle or strike at the back end of the spear, depending on how it came down. Um, so you might you know, fire it all the way over and then come in. That's fine against an advanced combat. If you can only use the tip, though, we can't slash. Then being down there doesn't help you much. Of course, we felt it many times. So um, you got to get this one just to pull it off and just barely move it. So it's just sitting pretty much on your hip. Maybe try resting that backhand actually on your hip and feeling it not, because you'll feel a pull once you get further over than that. Um, it's more rigid than I think you should fight usually, but if it gives you that little bit of deflection and immediate counter, that's, I think, the essence of that. So my guess, do a bunch of entry drills. See if that helps out with it. All right, yeah, thanks. I'm sure the guys will love it too, because they get to strike at you a whole bunch of times, so.
Yeah, there's never a shortage of that. <laughs> what else we got? Hey, Brian, there's a question in the chat from someone who doesn't have a microphone. Uh, sure, go for it. I can't read it from here. Uh, so please. Bradley uh, says, uh, in his limited knowledge of spear fighting, particularly from the videos we've seen of Japanese techniques, there seems to be a great deal more regular tip manipulation. And is that something that carries through the Western tradition or something more suited to longer spears? Uh, say that middle part again. It seems to be a great deal of tip manipulation. Oh, well, there, you want to be precise with your tip, but because you've got to find the points in between the armor. Um, but they don't tend to do a lot of this sort of thing because you're still at base, you still have to go through some armor. So tip manipulation, probably my guess is a holdover from less armored combatants uh, where you're trying to a zig and zag. I haven't seen any evidence in the fighting treatises or in the iconographical sort of pictorial references that that was a common thing in the European spear. In fact, they mostly they talk about power of a spear thrust, not about uh, slipping it around gently around somebody's uh, guard and going in. Um, I think in a civilian context where you're wearing basically padded gear, there'd be a little more of that. And I guess the analog might be that fainting is still useful, right? If I move my spear off to one side and the person follows me a little bit, I can go around behind it. Or if I lean forward, if I lean my leg out and they shoot at that target and I pull back the last second, then I can fire back. So I think fainting is useful, but there isn't a lot of sort of moving the tip around the way you might find the Europeans, in part because this is already expended in terms of the power. I might play with it back here a little bit. I'll move the, the pennant around a little bit and such, but it's not really manipulating the point. Now, if we cross spears, then it matters very much which side of the spear I'm on. And I'll make small circles to go on one side or the other side of the spear based on what that cross looks like. Um, but you can also manipulate that thing just by changing sides and moving where you are. Uh, in short, I think the European spear, at least the way we're fighting it here, tends to be more about armored combat and thus more about power. So manipulating the tip isn't going to do you that much good um, if you don't have enough power to get there. Most of the tip manipulation stuff seems to be made at distance, um, whereas mostly the European stuff, always when you see people sort of back, they're always firmly sta standing back on a very strong base, uh, ready to drive that point through. It's a little different with staff, and Fury's got some stuff that's kind of unstable and outside, but I sort of question you know, when that might be used. Uh, certainly not in a battle situation. Does that answer that, hopefully? I think that, you know, that question cuts across not only the spear, but the longsword, too, because if you're in a military context, uh, you need the power. If you're in a civilian context where we're wearing jackets like this, power is less important. So the guards naturally move from way back here to far forward uh, until they're basically rapiers all the way forward. So the less power you need, the less coiled up the weapon has to be. And at all the points when I've seen the military spear, it's always well anchored here or here. Even when it's in one hand, it's back at the shoulder, ready to drive down. Um, in a Greek context, my hand might be way at the back, there'd be a counterweight back here. It might be way at the back, and then I'm firing forward, using that counterweight to balance back the spear and then pull it back, pulling it backwards. So sort of an eight foot, um, sort of Athenian or Spartan Greek spear and have a nice weight back here. And they still have the thing counterweighted up the shoulder and ready to go. In most cases fighting it up high, but there are some instances of people fighting it low. Um, so always attaching to one of the anchor points and using that for power. Same thing we teach for the sword in two hands or the sword in one hand for that matter. Good question though. Do you have any other ones? We could plan for this some next time. Okay, well, this is designed to be a pretty compact class just to give people sort of an idea. There is a document that goes into more detail and has some drills and whatnot, which I can't really show you with only one person. Um, but I'll make that available soon, or after, uh, soon after this thing cooks. I'll post that, as, uh, that document as well. There are a series of other pieces I've been working on for the Spear too. Um, worked on an intermediate and advanced one with the Spear, which talks a lot more about distance, timing, and controlling the tempo of the fight, transitioning, and then using the spear more in a sort of Fiorian way. I have a whole other module on Fiorian spear. It talks about all of Fiorian's plays and breaks it down the right and the left. Um, and then I've got another sort of academic piece looking at the uh, change in use of the spear from one hand to two. 
So over the next year or so, those will all come out. They're all in the draft review stage, except for the, the academic ones. So um, in fact, I probably would have had the first one out um, in Acta periodically, Periodica Dualitorum, except that I missed the deadline by like a week. I didn't know they had a deadline. So um, that will not be available on, through them. I'll just go ahead and post that one on the academia page. Um, and I'll post it, the links here so you can get at it. But, you know, the spear is a fantastic, fun, super fun weapon. I hope that we can sort of introduce other things, the pole axe, and we can talk about some of the advanced stuff with the spear too, particularly when we can get another opponent there. Uh, the idea behind these sort of studio Zoom sessions is that maybe we can get it to be two-way. So if we can see what you guys are doing out in your backyard or the field, uh, then you can watch what we're doing here. We can actually do something resembling a remote class, um, sort of two-way coaching. Uh, that's, you know, there's choke points on both ends of that. I've got the network up and running here at my place, but there's some, still some hardware issues going on. Um, and then, of course, getting a camera out to where your practice is uh, could be kind of interesting for two-way communications too. Um, but I think we can do it. Uh, we can at first do uh, testing and things like that, but later on I'd like to actually see us go ahead and do uh, some coaching sessions and sort of synchronous classes as well. Uh, we'll time between here and say, Oh, your last commit there. Okay, any other questions? All right, then. Um, I'll go ahead and close this down for today. Um, send me messages through. I, can, I get a copy of the chat, so I can go look at these then. Um, that's a limitation of where we are right now, is I can't see the chat. Um, but we'll make a rate, we'll, you know, we'll improve this slightly for the next time. And I'm not sure what Marshall class we might do next. Um, there's been some calls for Polax that might be kind of fun. I'm gonna kind of really like to get a second person here when we do that, um, just so we've got um, coverage there. So um, have a good afternoon. I'm glad everybody's being safe. This is about as far as we can go with only one person in the room. So uh, take care, everybody. Until next time.